hello everyone uh welcome uh, to our very first event for race awareness week uh, i am michelle uh, i'm part of a team of um, academics that are all part of race awareness week uh, so this is a cross-curricular event that happens every year um, and this year it's hosted by the faculty of economic and management sciences um, hence you guys will see the theme that we have where we're going to be discussing today um, the intersection of race and economics. Uh, we have a very, very talented spoken word poet, Kuno Celestial, that's going to be joining us. Um, but I'm going to leave Pamela to do the introductions. Um, so just as a quick word of welcome, this is the first event um, that's happening a little bit earlier than the rest of the Race Week events, which is happening 3 to 7 May. Um, all of the details will be up on the NWU website. Uh, we would love it if you guys would join us for more of the events. Um, and so really just to set the tone for what it is that we are hoping to achieve in this session um, is that we are keenly aware that as an intellectual community and as a university, both the staff and students, that we need to have difficult conversations about race. Um, that being said, we really encourage everyone to be respectful, um, that there is really a feeling and an approach of learning from one another, that we definitely have um, the difficult conversations, but that we also remain respectful at all times. Also to uh, just make sure um, that even if you guys throughout the session are kind of feeling uncomfortable, what we're really encouraging uh, throughout the whole of race awareness is for us to be comfortable in the uncomfortable. Um, so that's really what I would encourage everyone uh, to go through today as we go through this workshop, um, but also to remember to have fun. Uh, that would be ultimately uh, a really great way for us to have you all experience this workshop, that balance um, of what it is that I've just discussed. Um, so without any further ado, I'm going to give over to Pamela, who is going to introduce our spoken word poet. Pamela, over to you. Thank you so much, Michelle. Good morning, everyone. I just want to double check if you can hear and see me. All right. Thank you and um, a good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome again to um, the Spoken Word Workshop by Puno Silisho. I hope I'm saying your, your surname correctly. I am Swati. Please um, <laughs> bear with me. My name is Pamela Manana, and um, my job is to introduce our um, lovely poet, Miss Celestia, and I hope I can do this talented poetic genius justice. Um, TBN, Sunlam, Unilever, these are just three of the companies that Ms. Puno has either performed for or collaborated with. Um, describing herself as a thinker and a strategist, Puno has definitely earned the description of multi-talented. Um, dabbling in not just poetry, but TV presenting, voiceovers and writing, the list goes on. Spoken word poetry being an evident main passion, Puno has performed in countries like Germany and in front of prominent figures like our very own Cyril Ramaphosa. Puno believes she exists to inspire and that, and that she will do throughout this journey um, of this workshop having written thought-provoking conversation starter pieces of poetry, Puno believes we can change the world with our creativity. Um, sorry, let me not lose my answer, but <laughs> Puno's poetry um, reflects her truth as well as different stages in her life. A bold writer, a fierce performer, Puno believes, um, she believes she should leave her audiences challenged aware and sparks conversations that summon change. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming the special young lady, Miss Puno Silisho. You sit there with expectations of rich soil, beautiful grasslands, people with extreme African dark tans. Well, I have concrete and pits of sand, milky skin surrounding me. My stars move with flight and out of my townhouse windows. I see them then quickly out of sight. Clicks and beats you desire to roll off my tongue, but instead you hear evidence of previous colonies formed by British sons. You desire my eyes to feast on Jump magazine, but I'm holding my fair lady. Similarly, I'll ignore generations for glee. 
My plate is not filled with samp and beans, but sushi, beef fillets, all trimmed and lean, close to master chef regime. I chuckle, as my fellow shaded brothers and sisters say, Ufana nam lungu. Huh? I tell them to translate what they convey. The mockery continues in Vernac. It's like a membership in the Black United community is what I lack. Am I not an African too? Has my upbringing in the suburbs made me lose my roots? I've lost my label of black and a coconut is what I've been tagged. But today, I refuse to allow your pencil to draw a picture of who I am, for I am as African as the music in life, the beat, the melody, and the tune. I have a twinkle in my eye that reflects the sub-Saharan moon. I am a daughter of this land. I am a child of Azania. I love my country, and I celebrate my modern culture. So today, I remove these limitations, and I claim my identity back, because an African is exactly what I am. Hello, hello, ladies and gentlemen. I won't say boys and girls because I assume that we're all over the age of 18 in this room. <laughs> and welcome to the Spoken Word Workshop with me, Puna Silisho. Um, I really hope that you enjoyed that piece. Um, that was a piece, I am an African. And I just want to first say <laughs> thank you, Pamela. <laughs> and I want to say thank you to the NWU team. Um, you guys have been amazing to walk this journey with. Um, we were hoping that this was going to happen last year. And a year later, here we are, more excited than ever. So I've had a whole year to build up this excitement and this energy in order to, to be here with you guys. Um, and to equip you with some tools. And that's essentially what we're gonna do is inspire and equip. Those are always the two things that I aim to do in any sort of session, whether it's a workshop, whether it's a presentation, people must be inspired, but they must also be equipped. So if you guys are ready, I'm gonna get straight into it. We cool, we good, we good. Cool, 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 cool. Um, this will be available for you to, to share later on YouTube. So the session will be amazing for you to just be with us, check in, be present, um, and walk the road. Um, I promise you, it's not going to feel academic at all. Um, and also just a bit of, of a disclaimer on my side, all of the views that are expressed here today are my own. Um, I'm not here to push any agenda, not even my own agenda, to inspire you and equip you. Because the conversation around race is a big one, and it's one that we're going to be dealing with for a very long time especially because of where we're at in South Africa. Um, we are a multicultural, multi-generational, uh, multi-race nation, which means that we are always going to be having the race conversation and we just get better at it. And the, the conversation itself is not an issue. Um, the thing is we don't have the right tools and we don't know how to engage with it. And throughout my now 11 year career as a, as a poet, I have used poetry as my tool um, to engage in the races, in the race space um, whether I'm in predominantly white spaces, whether I'm in predominantly black spaces, whether I'm in my own family, where we have a variety of, of cultures from Bedi to Tsonga to Afrikaans to now the mixed race kids that we have. It's, it's a whole mixed match. Um, poetry has been the thing that I've been able to use to engage. Um, and this is what I want to be able to bless you guys with. So let's get going. So again, hello, my name is Puno. So just so you know how I got into poetry or how poetry found me, the first poem that I ever remember writing and actually being recognized was when I was in about like grade four or something like that. And I wrote um, a poem for my mom. It was for Mother's Day and my church was having a competition. And I entered and I remember, <laughs> I remember it, it, each line would rhyme. So it was like, Two, two rhyming lines, 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 like any good grade four poet would do. And I came second in a competition um, and I got um, a prize for, I think at the bookstore um, with my mom, she could get something and I could get something. And I was like, hey. um, I really did think it was like a stroke of luck. I didn't think that it was anything major except when I got to grade 10 and my, my school was having a talent show. Um, and I really had this like vision because I'm quite like, like uh, Pamela said, I'm a strategist. So I had this vision of like somebody saying a poem and a ballerina dancing to the poem and somebody on keys, like doing piano style and all of those things. So I researched poems are crazy um, because I, I was going to recite the poem, but I didn't 
feel like I could write it. Um, and I, I, I don't know if you guys know the movie For Colored Girls. And I watched that movie, which is based on poetry. It, essentially, the whole movie um, is based on a series of poems. And I chose a poem, but it just didn't fit. And eventually, I was just like, okay, I won't be using your stuff, but instead, I will write my own poem. And that was when I wrote my first spoken word piece called Addiction. Yeah, it was quite a, a deep and, and emo title, but that's a different story. And um, I got such good feedback and such good reviews that I started writing more for my school, for the platforms that I had there, more for the church that I was involved in and all these various clubs. I started um, attending, I was in high school, but I was attending the, the spoken word um, sort of groups that were like underground at university because my sister was at at that point, um, just learning the space. and. Yeah, the rest is history. The, the more I put my stuff online, the more people got to see my stuff, the more jobs I would get and the more I would write and get a job here, get a job there. So poetry is the thing that I get paid for, essentially. Um, and the thing that I, I have become, I suppose, a bit more known for. Um, and eventually in 2019, that's when I got to the point where I could quit my day job and be a full freelancer <laughs> and create and strategize and run things and you know do do my stuff and it's it's been the most rewarding journey so far um so i tell you all of this so that you know that you are in capable hands of somebody who who does know the space and wants to again equip you with the tools so that you can flourish in this space so we are going to look at first, what is the purpose of poetry? Why in the world does this tool exist? Yes, words are beautiful. Yes, all of these various things, but why in the world do we even use this thing? Why, why would we even want to be poets or write poetry? Why would we even want to enter the competition um, and get that prize? Why? The first thing I would say is because we want to process things. We want to process information. We live in a time now where there's more information being thrown at us than ever before. You know, those, those things that they say that we process more information in a day than somebody in 19 put that contain times would process in like a lifetime. So we are consistently and continuously rather being bombarded with a lot of information, whether it's from advertising, whether it's other people's stories, whether it's other people's traumas, whether it's any bits of information is always, we always have access to it, whether it's on social media, whether it's on the news, whether it's having access to WhatsApp, meaning you're, you're having 20 conversations at the same time. And for me, I have like 170, 400 messages at the moment on my phone, which means there are 174 conversations that I could be having at exactly the same time, which means our brains, our hearts, our minds, our souls need a place and a space so we can process and filter out this information to be like, what do I want? What do I resonate with? What don't I resonate with? What do I believe? What do I actually believe? The world is telling me what I'm allowed to and not allowed to believe, what's right, what's inappropriate, what's, what's, what's going to get you cancelled by cancel culture, you know, what's going to get you fired, what's, what's good, what you're allowed to feel. There's, a, there's, a, there's new conversations around race, around gender, around mental health. Where do I stand on all of this? Do I need to stand somewhere? All of these things, we tend to, to want to process it on social media and out loud. But what poetry does for you, it gives you a space where you can process internally, process with yourself. And even if you share your poetry with other people, maybe with safe other people, because by acknowledging the fact that it is a process and that you are processing means you're acknowledging the fact that you're not at a perfect place. So it's a non-judgmental space meaning there's no fear of the cancel culture. There's no fear of being judged or not being cool or not being right. So the fact that it's a process means your opinion is allowed to change. I can write a poem. There's many poems that I've looked at that I've written years ago that I'm like, eh, I don't agree with that anymore. And there's some poems that are, are gonna change shape. Some poems that are gonna remain my values and my opinion forever. But that's the beauty of poetry. We are, we are all balls of clay and we are being molded and we're growing and we need spaces where we have that kind of grace and that space where we can con continue to do that because right now in society that's not quite present um, at the moment and poetry allows you to to have that 
second thing that poetry does, we get to express ourselves. We get to, to, to show the world and give the world a gift of who we are, of our talents, of our words, of our creativity, our art, our emotions, our thoughts, our feelings. We get to engage. We get to have a dialogue. The beauty about music and poetry is that you, when you, when you say a poem, or when you um, sing a song, you have access to people's emotions and to people's thoughts immediately. Think about it. When you're listening to radio and a song comes on, you don't, unless you change the station channel, you don't decide whether that, that song or whatever the person on radio is saying has access to your internal mind space or heart space. It automatically does. And that's the power of art. That's something that not even your lecturer, not even a politician can do, can have access to, to shape your views, to change your views, to impact your soul, to pull on your heartstrings. Art automatically has access to that, which means as we express ourselves, we get that human to human connection. We actually get to engage, we get, we get to, to be empathetic, we get to learn about one another because we are expressing ourselves. A disclaimer with that, because art gives you access to people's minds, thoughts, and souls, we need to use that wisely. We need to use that with care. We've seen in past, I mean, I, I did history only in, in high school, but one of the things that I saw is that propaganda was a big thing, that politicians and different regimes and different systems would use art, would use posters, would use all these things to... to sort of construct and form and shape people's views using art, because that's how powerful it is. But that means we need to be conscious and aware of how we're using it, why we're using it, and with who we're using it with. Um, and that's, that's basically just saying that we have that responsibility. Yes, we have the right, but we also have the responsibility. Another purpose of poetry is to teach. And when I say teach, I'm not talking about your lecture. This is, this is not a lecture hall. I'm saying I have a specific narrative as a black South African female. I have a specific story and I have a specific experience that maybe a lot of, a lot of South Africans, a lot of people in the world might not know or might not understand. And in order for me to be accurately represented, included, um, and embraced in this world, I may need to teach people about my experience and invite them into my world and say, hey, these are some things you might not know. Let me show you, let me tell you, let me help you, let me assist you. In the same way, other people, I can learn from their story, their experience. They might have knowledge and tools that I don't know about, whether be it race, whether be it anything, anything, anything. Poetry is an effective way of teaching people, of, of uh, transferring knowledge and also learning. So for instance, with the Black Lives Matter movement, which is the image that you, you see here, a lot of the, the conversations were, were quite hectic and heavy and we weren't hearing one another. But the moment you put it in something like a poem or a song, a person is more willing to engage and listen because it doesn't always feel like a direct attack and it doesn't also always feel like um, they're going to have to answer for their actions immediately. Poetry, art, music provides a safer space to be able to have the hard conversations and to be able to teach one another um, the, the, the knowledge and the wisdom and the experience that we have. Again, it's a very simple principle. It takes you very long to, to study a textbook and to remember the contents thereof. But if you listen to a song four times by the end of it, by, by time number five, you know all the lyrics and then you're there, demo lemming, doing the things. You don't, you don't even know that you're singing until you're in the shower. So that is the same concept with poetry. There's, there's the rhythm, the tools, the, the, the structure of the poetry lends itself to work with the way our brains have been molded so that we can internalize information easier and internalize information in a way that will be effective. Um, so again, it's a learning space. It's something that we, we, can, we can learn, understand and pass on to others. One of my favorite, favorite purposes of poetry is to break things. Words are so powerful. Words have the ability to break systems and to build systems up, which we'll speak about now. 
we are in a i mean i was when i was when i was in varsity i was part of the the fees must fall movement so the whole fallist thing it, it's been going on for quite some time before even um, fees must fall and stuff like that it just takes on different names every couple of decades you know but we are still deconstructing we are deconstructing the things we've grown up knowing the things our parents taught us the the way our parents taught us specific religion or specific ways of seeing cultures and races or systems or politics and all of those things we are getting to a place where we are refining where we are shaking the foundations of things that don't sit well with us because as humans we're evolving as a society we're evolving so therefore the systems the structures the thoughts the the ways of doing things need to evolve with us but before we can build something new we need to break some things down and that's where we get to interrogate things using our words to ask the right questions to ask all questions to try to seek answers to poke at things to be like is that really okay? Is that really right? The way we've we've labeled things, is that really how I want to do it? Again, whether we're speaking about race, whether we're speaking about gender, whether we're speaking about um, anything, anything in those fields about religion, all of that, we now have a tool that we can use to question, to inter interrogate and to break and to actually be like, yeah, that's not allowed anymore, this far and no further. And as much as I'm not necessarily the biggest fan of cancel culture, there is a place for, for being um, sort of, what's the word? We, where we have to have a no compromise standpoint where some things are just not allowed. For instance, with things like gender-based violence, if we're using poetry as a tool to teach people who may not have access to necessary social media or have access to, to political campaigns or whatever, Art can reach people everywhere and tell them and show them what is okay and what is not okay. That's how we can reach young men and women who are struggling in these kinds of spaces. Again, when we're speaking about gender-based violence to be like, amen, um, that used to be okay in society, but we've evolved, women's rights have evolved. And this is this is how we, we are going forward as a community and as a society. And poetry can do that. We can really bring entire systems down and help people reshape the way that they think about things. And then the last one, what do we use poetry for is to build. A big problem with what we have today and why the race conversation doesn't always seem like it's moving forward is because we've stopped here. We've stopped at the breaking. We've deconstructed, we've made things fall, we've pulled things down, we've, we've shouted across um, across barriers, across um, different sides and said, this is not right, this is not okay, standing up for our rights, becoming anti-racist and all those things. And that's good, but we stopped there. Where we need to go to now, where we need to continue, as much as we continue breaking, we need to also continue building. What is the vision of the future? If this is not the racial society that we want now, where we still have incidences of, of racial oppression, of systematic racism, of all of these different things of, um, yes, as much as we do have people in, incorporating and maybe there's more diversity, how do we get more inclusion? What does inclusion look like? If we are complaining now, okay, so what do we want? How do we get there together? We may not have the answers in terms of the how, but at least let's have a vision so we know where we're going. Any good company has a mission and a vision statement so that the employees can know that yes, we might be at A, but we're aiming to get to Z. And how we get there, that's our job every single day. It's the reason they wake up in the morning to be there. Whether it's Coca-Cola and you wanna spread happiness, whether it's McDonald's and you're all about family, whether you're Uber and all you're trying to do is connect people, that's the vision, that's the goal. As poets, as people who do art, we get to stand and declare the vision. We get to stand and be like, this is where we're going. So we inspire people so that people have hope, so they don't lose heart. So no matter what, whether you're having a, a, a dialogue, a heated conversation with a friend or, around race, whether you are fighting fees must fall, whether you're engaging with any other systematic sort of component, whether it is in the economy, you know what you're doing it for, even if you don't see the results right now. A lot of the words that we, we say and we speak now, I always refer to words as seeds. And a lot of the work I do, I call it words that, words that grow. It's the cheesy thing of the words and the seeds that we plant today will grow into trees. And we might not be able to sit under those trees, but our kids will and our kids' kids will. Because I know for a fact 
that I am sitting under and I am enjoying the fruit of a tree that my parents and my grandparents built already. My, my grandparents, um, they, they pastored a church for a very long time and they were, were quite active in, in the communities that they, were, that they were in. They fought racial oppression. They um, fed people, they housed people, they stood up to people for other people. They've, they even housed um, some of the anti-apartheid sort of activists. They've engaged and they were adamant on living a multiracial existence. So they were adamant on engaging, no matter whether you're white, black, colored from overseas, local, they were adamant on connecting on a human to human level. So for me, that goes without saying in terms of my, in my values, being an inclusive person and having the hard conversations and engaging in a way that's authentic and difficult for the purpose of living side by side with one another is just naturally part of me because that's the 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 heritage and that is the almost the inheritance that I got from my parents and my grandparents so now for us what are we building where are we going and what's important to note here as well is that you can see that breaking and building both have sparks there's fire in both elements there which means some words are going to be destructive and it's necessary to destroy certain things but some words are going to be used to build, but you need to be careful and know the difference. The same flame, the same fire, but what are you using it for? And be intentional about that and know your audience, know your space. We can't always be breaking, we can't always be breaking. There needs to be a time to build, but at the same time, you cannot ignore people's pain and the fact that we are still in pain as a nation. So you cannot be casting vision and speaking hope and like, oh, what, 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 if it's inappropriate, if it's not the right time. Because that's, that was the main problem with the narrative around the Rainbow Nation, right? We came out and were like, Rainbow, Rainbow Nation, no, 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 no. But it wasn't the right time. People were still in a state of trauma and shock and had just gotten out of of systematic oppression, which we're still undoing today. And that's why people have rejected that notion completely, because it was misplaced. So it's the, it's the same fire, it's the same flame, but you need to know, is it, are we breaking or are we building? Where are we? Are we doing both? And when you, when you guys are writing your poems for the competition, I want you to think of, are you going to be building with that poem? Is it to break? Is it to teach? Is it to express? Is it to process? and you're allowed to be at any step of the process. It's like the five steps of grieving. You decide where you're at um, and what you're doing particularly with that. So a lot has been said in this moment. We are definitely not done, but I do want to pause and take some time to get any questions, um, whether it's in the chat box. Um, Pamela and Michelle, you guys can also let me know if there are questions that you've seen come up. Uh, yeah, um, Puna, we do have a question um, from Colette, uh, and then I see, uh, is it Grizani who has her hand raised? So um, I think maybe what we're going to do is I'll quickly read you Colette's question. There's also been so many comments about how amazing that first piece of yours was and everything that you've been saying, how well it's been resonating with everyone. Um, but I'm going to read you Colette's question. I think you can um, answer that one. And then um, Grizani, I'll uh, call on you and then you can unmute your mic. It would be great to hear from you. So um, Colette says, I write poetry myself and I've had good comments in the past, but I'm extremely shy. Is it okay to be a poet without performing your poetry and allowing others to make their own own interpretations mm -hmm. I love that question absolutely absolutely I think um, I'll, I'll answer your question with um, a, a story and experience of mine there's a, a poetry community which is um, run by Afura Khan I hope it still exists called Word and Sound in Joburg um, which is quite big and established and they have these like Lambs and it's you know you can win and it's quite cutthroat um, and intense. It's a it's a space where people sh get sharpened and you know so you get there you perform and then they choose a top five and then there's the crown you like the king the word of the king or queen of the word or whatever I don't know. And I remember attending once because everybody told me about word and sound. Everybody said word and sound, word and sound, word and sound. And I went and it scared me. It just made me terrified because I was like, I don't resonate with that. I don't resonate with poetry being competitive. I don't resonate with poetry being 
a cutthroat space where I want poetry to be is a more of a safe space. Yes, I want to grow. I don't want to be mediocre in my art, so absolutely. But the way and that environment was was not for me. And people had told me that that's kind of the only route to becoming a professional poet or to becoming good at my poetry. But I made the decision that actually rather not, I'm just going to stick to the way I know. And I went back to Pretoria and we have our own things, both concessions there, which was <laughs> exactly what I needed. And I say that to you, Colette, to be like, absolutely, you can make it what you want it to be. Even if you wrote and never shared your poems with anyone, you're more than welcome. Um, I did drama in school up to matric. And one of the things that we would talk about was how there are times when you actually allow the audience to be the, the meaning makers, that they just receive the art piece and they make meaning out of it. They decide what it means for them. You're allowed to do that. Um, please never feel pressure to, to, to have to step outside of yourself. Um, Awesome. Thanks, Puno. Uh, we have a bunch of hands now. Um, I think uh, let's first, uh, in order of who raised first, um, I think it's first up, Ghazani. You can unmute your mic. Hi, uh, thank you very much for your great presentation. Um, I just want to ask, I'm a project leader for the SRCAs on campus. Um, that's our community service structures. And my, um, my project specifically focuses on women empowerment. And I would really like to give women in Port of Strum, in the more rural areas, a platform to um, express themselves with poetry. But I don't know what platform to use. So I'm trying to figure out, do I use Zoom? Do I... Um, find a way to get it in a book or a newspaper. I don't, I'm not sure. So I was wondering if you have any advice for me on that. Sure, absolutely. Um, first of all, I just want to say um, well done to you for, for being in that role and for, for having a heart for that. It's not an easy space and it, it, re it requires a liver. <laughs> it requires a lot of inner strength. So um, keep on keeping on. It's, it's important. Unfortunately, the gender-based um, uh, violence struggle and the women empowerment stuff and all of that stuff is going to be probably a lifelong fight, but it's one that we need to continue. Um, I would say ask them what they would prefer and also what access they have. So in terms of the tech side of things, if they have access to, to data and things like that, absolutely go the Zoom route. But also you can use WhatsApp and do a WhatsApp group so that they can share their, their words, their poetry, their stories that way. Um, Facebook has a Facebook free mode where people can post things. So you can maybe start a Facebook group where you, it can be private first if they are comfortable with that. Um, or if they want to share it to the public, they can do things like that. Um, but I think more importantly, asking them and allowing them to make the decision. So give them options. Maybe they even have a, a first a reading group or reading club where they meet with themselves um, three, three, four, four, you know, in small groups or all together, depending on COVID regulations. Um, and you encourage them to write on specific topics and empower one another first before sending their stories and their information out. Um, and doing it on a consistent basis. And because what all that, that will do, it will help them build confidence, help them um, again, empower one another and to, to, to use their voice, learn how they can use their voice in an artistic manner. Um, and then, yeah, there's many competitions. Um, I mean, I'm happy for Michelle to give my details out in terms of like the AFBOB poetry competition and stuff like that, for instance, where they can enter in any of their 11 official languages. So um, there, there are opportunities, but definitely engage with them and ask them and keep it, keep it relevant to their context. Um, yeah. Awesome, thanks Puna. Uh, we have our next hand. Uh, you're more than uh, welcome to unmute yourself. Awesome. Hi, my name is Mwako. Um, a couple of questions, if I may. The first one is around engagement with, with poets. So I've never written a poem in my life. And, um, and, and, and they, I find that there's not always space to, for people who are non-poets to engage with poets in 
non-poetic terms. Mm. For example, you, you write and perform a piece. Um, do you find poets to be available for people to critique their stuff outside of the academic space in non-poetic terms and to engage non-poets? Or, or do you find poets to at times be exclusive mm. to non-poets? and even perhaps see non-poets as the lesser, um, that if you can't engage me at this elite art level, you are not worthy of, of that. Yet, the purpose, yes. one of the purposes of poetry is to teach. Yes. You know, do you get taught back by non-poets? No. Do poets allow, allow that? Then the, the next yeah. thing is poet poems as expression of of identity mm. and one of the issues i hear in in you know in the poem that you performed is is your identity mm. as a, as a black woman or a young black woman and um i on identity levels, I, I, I see a lot of tension between the relationship between a black female mm -hmm. and a black male. And, um, and particularly in these times of gender based violence and why that is relevant is that you know from a race perspective in south africa you know gender based violence is often perpetrated by you know um, males against females who are closest to them so for a black woman it will be a black male who is if you are young who is young as well and that relationship between a young black male and a and a young black female is one probably that requires a lot of healing. Yeah. But with so much negativity in that type of relationship, do you, do you see poets focusing on the opposite of that negativity, mm. you know, to tell perhaps the last story between a young black male and a young black female, mm -hmm. um, which is the antithesis or the opposite of the violence and the difficulties and the lack of love, etc. Thank you. Beautiful question. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, with the first question, I 100% agree with you. The answer is no. Um, poets are not inclusive enough in my my opinion and that's something that frustrates me <laughs> it, it frustrates me and it angers me because in my head i'm like why would i want to write poetry for other poets like why are we just you know the almost an incestuous <laughs> sort of intellectual pool my my the point of my poetry is to serve and that means I need to be able to, to take people on a journey. So yes, not compromise my poetic license, not compromise my, my poetic tools and things like that, but at the same time, be able to use it in a way that anyone from any field can understand. It's like walking into a doctor's room and they give you all these big sort of medical terms about what's wrong with you, but you leave not understanding what's wrong with your body. How are you going to even do next steps? How are you going to take care of yourself? How are you going to feel comfortable and safe and seen? You won't. You'll never go back to the doctor. And that's the same with a poet. If we're here to diagnose the soul and heal the soul, we need to be able to be like, cool, we've studied, we know, we've, we've engaged in all of that, but we, we need to transfer it in a way that um, is understandable. But at the same time, we are all human beings and nobody's better or lesser than the other. So we need to be more open to getting critique or getting input and feedback. So I once did a course um, where they said that the meaning of my communication is what the other person has understood. So if you Marco, listen to a poem and you don't understand anything or you, you understand B, but I actually meant A, 
if my purpose is to serve you, I need to listen to that and adjust accordingly because you're not just my audience. You're the, you, again, you're the person that I'm serving. You are the point of the poem. You are the purpose of the poem. And I think as, as poets, we've gotten that wrong. I, I love to joke that poetry is like this underground movement with daishikis and dreadlocks and everyone smoking weed. And, you know, we just this holy huddle of like intellectual whatever. And for me, I'm like, yeah, if it ends there, I don't want it. I don't want anything part of that. For me, I, I, I poetry needs to be more accessible to a lot more people. Um, and again, this is why we have sessions like this. This is why I, I choose to, to, to collaborate cross-disciplinary collaboration kind of um, stops that um, if we get out of our heads and our holy huddle. With regards to your, to your second question, again, something that's so important and something that um, I believe we, we are not doing right necessarily at the moment as well as a nation. Um, I think we've done the best that we can. But my own personal recommendation is that poets, artists, Male poets and artists, black male poets and artists need to silence the violence within males first before we can even begin to have the conversation between black males and black females. We need to write the narrative of what does it mean, what is masculinity for a black male in South Africa today, knowing all that the black male has had to go through and suffer and endure, knowing that he's not allowed to have cried for however many generations now, who do we want to build the, 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 the black male to be in South Africa? How do we heal him? That is the conversation that I feel like arts needs to have. And the only people who can truly lead that conversation are other black males. Then once that's done, that's when I think we can move forward because the, the young black male today, the person that he's looking up to and who he, is his role model is Cuesta and Black Coffee and whatever other rapper there is out there and Java and whatever, whatever. And I'm not saying any of those people are bad. The, the, the art is incredible and amazing. But that goes to show that those men have a responsibility then to, in their art, in the conversations that they have, their interviews, to help black men find themselves, find their identity, because that's who the young black man is looking at. To, 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 they're aspiring to be like them. And then after that, I think we can start to have that conversation. I think females have been doing self-healing for a very long time um, through art and other means, but um, I think we, we, we need to heal the young black boy first. Um, No, thank you so much, and Wakov, thank you so much for that question. Uh, I think we have uh, Jolene who wanted to raise her hand and ask a question. Okay. Um, first of all, I would like to say thank you so much to Puno for all the advice and the guidelines that she's given through. So I have two questions. My first one would um, is, what was an early experience where you learned that language had power, and then? Uh, my second question um, is, so I have also been like writing poems and I think sometimes I overanalyze a situation and overthink things. So what advice would you give to me to like create the baseline for a poem? Um, I hope that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so the first one, the, the first question you asked, the simple and easy answer, it was seeing my grandmother on stages telling stories. Um, so I didn't get the the cute, you know, the the cute story that they always say with the, the, the older black female where she like gathers the kids around the fire and tells stories. For me, my grandmother was on platforms. So seeing her and the impact that she was having on the people in the room was like, whoa. And she was quite intense and quite convicting. But at the same time, people opened themselves out to up to her and um, that's how she helped healing. So seeing that as a kid was like, Whoa, that's amazing. There's something here. With your second question, before I answer it, Jolene, and I don't know if you mind unmuting, I want to find out what led you to the conclusion that made you think that you overanalyze with your poetry. Um, the, re the reason why I would think I'm overanalyzing um, a with poetry is because like, I would find a topic for a poem, right? And then I would write about it. 
but then I wouldn't let it go. So even after completing the poem, I would still constantly think about it. And to a point where it like gets too much and I'd be like, okay, Julie, now you need to switch off. I love that. I don't think you have a problem. I think all that means is that there's more poems that are pouring out of you. Um, there's no way that we can fully understand any topic. If you wanna write about a tree, which I'm looking at out of my window right now, one poem will never be able to fully encapsulate and comprehend that one tree, maybe a thousand and a hundred poems. So maybe I do believe in, in writing a poem, editing, re-editing and all of that, but getting to a point where you stop and you leave it alone. But if there's more buzzing out of you, write a new poem and write it out until there's nothing left. So I wouldn't say that you're overanalyzing. I think allow it to pour out. Everybody's process is different. Um, yeah, I think just keep writing more and new poems and look at it from different angles, which is something that we'll talk about um, now now as well. Um, I think we can have one more person ask a question and then we'll, we'll move on. Um, the next question I'm going to read out, if that's okay, it's from Portia. She wrote in the chat box. Personally love this question because it describes me too. <laughs> um, it says, I have been writing poems for a very long time and mainly write to express my feelings, but sometimes I feel like my poems don't make sense. After writing, I usually feel so overwhelmed and exhausted. Is that normal? So, that is, I understand that fully, <laughs> fully, fully, fully. I think, um, Something is to be said about the fact that the process of creating, whether you're creating a poem, whether it's an art piece, whether it's an assignment, is exhausting because you are pouring from yourself. So you will be tired. So if you feel tired afterwards, you've done well, basically. Um, in terms of you being overwhelmed, I'm not really sure what the source of that is, is from, um, but I don't think take that as a sign that um, you, you haven't written well. I think, Decide before you write the poem again, what is the purpose of this poem? If it's purely to process stuff and, and just vomit your emotions and vomit your thoughts, it doesn't have to make sense because we are we are complex jumbles of bodies of water people. Like nothing makes sense inside here. So if that's what it is, just get it out, get it out, get it out. If it's the purpose of the poem is to show it to somebody else and or to to again to teach or to you know it's an external thing then be a bit more cautious of um or rather a bit more aware of it being a a logical piece that has a, a clear beginning a clear middle and a clear end that a person can understand without again lo losing any of your poetic license or your poetic tools um but if it's just for you and yourself to process girl oh boy sorry um, you are more than welcome to, to to write as is and to just embrace the chaos, embrace the mess. Um, it's okay. Yeah. Uh, Puna, we do have another question oh, that oh, came oh. through. Um, yes, but yes, I was sure. I was going to say, um, Owen, we have another hand that's been raised now. So I think people are like really eager to still engage. So you should let me know. I mean, this is supposed to be a workshop. So I don't know if you want to kind of carry on with your slides and um, show some of your other poems. And then you want to address the questions and ra hands that have been raised towards the end. Um, or if you want to kind of deal with them all now. I think I don't know let's which... carry on with the slides and do some. Okay. And then we'll come back. Okay, sounds great. Please, guys, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Bruno. <laughs> So we get to the meat of the matter, friends. We get to race and poetry and how this has come about. And I'll tell you, I've gotten into also I have I have touched a lot of lives with a lot of my poems because I, I'm very outspoken when it comes to race. Um but I have found a way to listen first. So this is also an important tool. If you are a writer, you need to be the best listener in the room because there's, there's so much information, there's so many thoughts, opinions, views, stories, narratives going around that for you to craft your own, you need to be able to have listened and heard other people. Because when people read your pieces, they need to feel seen and feel heard. But if you are writing from a place of arrogance and this is my way and the highway and all of those things, you won't be as effective. So for me, what I think I've managed to do with the race conversation within poetry is yes, 
be open and honest and authentic with my own narrative, but do it in a way that other people are invited to share their own um, so that we can all kind of share our, our narrative. And I think I have been able to get past people's boundaries because when we have the conversation of race, people already shut down glaze over with their eyes they kind of it's just we, we're tired we have race fatigue but when you're engaging with it in a poetic element because there's a, an entertainment element as well um one can be it can be a bit effective so i am going to ask ian to please play poem number two we've already watched i am an african so we, now we're going to go to one called swat Khafa. Um, and then we're going to chat a little bit about that. Before we play Swat Khafa, please note and know that, again, these are all my own personal views. And it, it was quite a, a strong piece that wasn't to attack anyone, attack any race. Um, there, was, there was a time I got an email where somebody thought that I hated Afrikaans people because of, of this poem. That is not the case at all. Um, I wrote this poem after listening to stories from my dad um, and some of the experiences that he had during a birthday. And I was like, sure, there's, there's in some ways still things that are happening now in society where I am made to feel like I am nothing more than a danger in society or something to be, to be managed, something to be, to be controlled and uplifted with little programs or whatever. But I'm actually like a full blown thinking, feeling human with all my faculties in place. I have value, I have importance as a black female in South Africa. And I, I made this poem powerful and a strong statement in order to, to make a point, but definitely not to, to offend, rather to, to provoke um, and provoke thinking. Um, so please be open-minded and open-hearted and receive it with There's a sort of sweet, sick joy I derive from saying this term. I enjoy the way the weight of mischief drops in my voice when I say it. Diswat Khafar. Ak is Diswat Khafar. Diswat Khafar is me. To think that just by mere existence, I ignite fear. Just by walking a bit too close to you in the mall, I make you wonder if you were ever really safe at all. What do you think about when you see me? Genuinely. Admit it. You're scared. My presence concerns you. And I get it. I know you don't, so let me explain my danger to you. I am a walking, talking revolution. My revolt begins with the daily denial of the insecurities and complexities that should be stapled to my title of black. My self-love is deadly. I'm intrigued by my own very blackness. And yes, I see your eyes linger longer. Are you afraid that on my charcoal skin, your lustful desires might spark and burn and stain? <laughs> Diswat Khafar is real, mate. Subconsciously, the entire nation is thinking it. How dare you love who you are? How dare you jog here, in this place, where your father once scattered manure on his master's land? How dare I screech down the streets in my bucky, belting out with Mumford and Sons and those ratchet hip-hop sounds and a bit of heel song all in one trip, using the same route on which my mommy used to carry her dompas with? How dare you have goals and visions of yourself wearing a graduation cap and not just taking an order under a hairnet in a KFC or chicken licking hat. How dare you dare to dream. How dare you acknowledge and smile at every car guard, every fruit man selling to eat, every paper boy high-fiving. How dare you swear back at the beggar who swore at you for acting too white and too bougie. Why do you keep trying to shrug off the chip that you have every right to have on your shoulder? How dare you aim to love relentlessly, unapologetically, and at times fail at it, dismally? Yes, a khafar make it. 
Bakuchaba Banu, Hella is bang, because they've never known a Kabi Sovili as he discovers what a black boy be. They've never been so close to a vibrant energy as you walk out with pride the journey of a blackberry goddess. As you live like you weren't a mistake, like you weren't a plan B, like this world and that coffee shop was built for you too, that you belong, how dangerous you are, existing and defining. What gives you the right to insist on your name? To live it out the way your daddy desired for you, dear girl. Kiwenapuno, harvest, ntobelo. You're not only meant for labor and toil, just for others to reap entertainment and nice things. Liwena, ija joy. Thrive in excellence, dance in wonder, sweat, work hard, toil, and then, baby girl, eat. Enjoy life. You were meant to be, and because you love out loud and live boldly, you are a swat khafar. You're a danger to whitewashed spaces, to blacks who wished you stayed in your lane. You confuse that one guy who said your extramural activities aren't black. I'm a flower child by nature. I picnic and frolic in forests, fam. That's <laughs> what I do. You are certainly a threat to governments and politicians who think they can slack in their execution of duties but take your loyalty just because of a shared history. How dare you question the authority that's in their overstuffed bellies? Who are you to expect what was promised? You are a code red to those who heard your loud and hearty laugh in high school and called you ghetto. To those who said your hair made more sense straight. You cause a short circuit in the brains of those who don't understand that you have to live huge, for you exist for your family, for every black girl, for every black boy, for God, and for you. You anger those that don't understand that you still struggle, and at times are still rummaging and maneuvering through the broken parts of your parents that the past shattered. Ye is a swat khafar mekint and the apple certainly hasn't fallen far from the tree. My dad's name is a political story. His dad named him Petro. His friends called him Petros. Apartheid said, Nya, yes, Pietrus. And the activist said, Peter. But my dad transcended every barrier that came with each name and decided to just be. Papa, you are a revolution. Thank you for teaching me that excellence and blackness are one in the same. For raising me in joy. For teaching me what Swat Khafa really means. Hey, dun 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 dun. That piece makes me slightly emotional. <laughs> Like, wow, makes me miss my dad. <laughs> it's, oh, yeah. Um, again, it was written from a place of hearing some of the struggles my dad went through. I mean, it, it, and also just what he was teaching me when he was telling me the stories. He was just like, girl, do your thing. Just like the world will tell you that you're this or that you're not this, or you're allowed to be this, or you're allowed to do that. Whether it's black or white, people always want to tell you what you can or cannot do or what you should or shouldn't be. Just do you, boo boo, is what he was basically saying. And I mean, he he worked in a garden, went to school, had to quit, worked as like a nanny, came back, worked in a bar, came back all the way through high school, and then eventually varsity, and eventually got his degree and stuff when he was thirty. And he paved his own way because he was like, eh, I'm just gonna do my own thing. Um, and I definitely am my daddy's little girl. <laughs> So I have a question for you guys and anybody can answer this. If we look now, dun, 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 and so we've looked at I'm an African and Swat Kafa, and I want you to tell me when it comes to I am an African, what do you think the purpose of this poem was? Was it for me to process? Was it for me to express? Was it for me to teach? Was it for me to break? Or was it for me to build? Um, yeah, I'd love to, to hear what you guys think. And then also with Swat Kafa, was it for me to process? Was it for me to, to express? Was it for me to teach, to break or to build? And it could be two or more of those things. Um, I'd love to hear, or you can put in the chat. Let's see what is happening. Um, yeah, so you're more than welcome to 
Hey, Jolene, I see you. Please answer. You can unmute or you can pop it in the chat. You're welcome to be either. I think Marco first, if I'm not mistaken. Sorry. Was Marco first? Please okay. confirm. And if he was, he can more can he can come through and, and answer your question for now. Perfect. Sorry, mine was not to answer that question. It was just to engage um, you know, after she 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 was done with the poem, so you can give a chance to those who want to answer that question. Okay, I have um, an answer to the question. I think that you were just trying to emphasize that you feel oppressed and you know that um, you want to make it known that you, how you feel and it's your view on how you feel and um, you're not turning a blind eye on it. You, you're you not like other people which just say, okay, I've been racially abused, but you know what? It's like that, it's the country we in, we have to go on and move on. You didn't do that. You wanted to make it known to everybody that what I'm going through is tough and you need to know about it and you need to see my view and join me in fighting this revolution because I'm not alone. There's a lot of people out there that are suffering. And um, yes, that's what I think. I'm mainly emphasizing that you are feeling oppressed and you want people to know that you're not oblivious about that. Yeah, that's so good. Such a beautiful answer. Thank you. Thank you, Samaya. Anyone else? Jolene, are you still there? Um, yes, I am. So I believe with um, both these um, poems, you were mainly trying to express and to teach um, because with the first one, you were trying to express your Afri Africanacity and trying to show who you are. And in the second one, you're trying to express your blackness in the poem. And then with the teaching part, I believe that you are trying to teach people that it's okay to be me, okay to be you, and not specifically you as the poet, but you as the poet and the person as the reader trying to teach them it's okay to be you, but do it responsibly. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. Exactly, exactly, exactly that. I think with I'm an African that came at the end of a process um, where I had processed internally like I, I was a black female growing up in the suburbs in a white space and I just didn't feel like I quite fit and I feel like I was disqualified from a lot of things because of that and after internally processing that I expressed that like actually no this is kind of you know my experience and I'm expressing who I am and who I'm deciding to be and with Swat Kafa it was also that it almost expressing um what I what I listened and surveyed from my yes, my dad, but other people's experiences and my experiences as well. So I, I was expressing that, but I was definitely also teaching, teaching other people that hey, this is an experience or a version of the experience that you might not actually have heard before. Listen, hear, respond from whatever place. So there was definitely expression, definitely teaching, and a tiny bit of process in that. Um, and with Swat Papa, you could even say there was a bit of breaking because I wanted to break that narrative of like there's a mold that you're supposed to be or there's a feeling that you're allowed to, to hit as a Black South African that you're not really allowed to go more. And if you study and become, I don't know, a lawyer or a doctor or whatever, you're just one of the exceptional ones. It's like, no, we're just all humans who have a lot of potential, a lot of capacity. And yes, there's obstacles in the way, but we are working to get past those obstacles, not because it's miraculous, but because we were born for it. We were born to be great, just like any other South African, just like any other white South African. Um, so yes, 110%. Um, I am seeing some comments. I don't know if Pamela wants to read any of the comments out and also give a chance to Marco to engage um, after the, the poem. Definitely, I love reading. <laughs> Um, I think it's from Grizzoni, the first one, it says, I think Swat Fapa was break and build. Break being breaking the apartheid views of Black people and to build, um, meaning really showing who you are, flower child, frolicking. And then Zuni Sani, who I know, hi Zuni, he's all the way from Val, he says, I believe that um, with both poems, you were giving people awareness 
that it's okay to be you. You don't need to change because of the community you were living in and how you were treated. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, Rosani and Jinsan. Um, Wako, I'd love to hear um, your comments, please. Hi. Yeah, I mean, I, I think your this particular poem um, is provoking in a very important way because so you there is a part about Swat Khafar here, which has got very little to do with white people, um, which you are talking about, and that is your your identity to other black people that, that I'm hearing in in the poem. And I think that's important because I think struggles of um, identity and oppression and et cetera, et cetera, is how black people relate with themselves and how they judge one another for for being and also competition of, of being a black or what blackness means mm -hmm. um, to deferring black people. And I think that's a conversation that you are having. And I think that's what a lot of us are, are struggling with. You know, the, the, the unending debates about, you know, coconuts and, 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 and related issues. Um, and the one thing that's going to become a major issue is going to be around uh, black people who cannot speak what is perceived to be black languages. Mm -hmm. And a lot of black people are in the future are going to be judged for that very harshly by other black people. And young black people are going to struggle with issues of identity about that and how are they and how they are going to find uh, to accept themselves in that reality is going to be a very challenging but an, a very important issue in the near future and i think you know you are prophesying about that particular thing that i think is coming through and, and i really like that. 110%, 110%. And um, it's, it's, yeah, it's been part of my struggle personally as well. Um, and I see it with my nieces and nephews as well, where again, for instance, my, my sister is half Betty, half Donga. Um, her husband is Zulu, but they go to an English school. So English is what they mainly speak. And then Annie speaks Donga. So ultimately what ends up happening is the child chooses English. And it's, 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 yeah, it's complicated. <laughs> so it's, it's definitely something we're gonna to need to navigate. Um, we're gonna play daughter now, and I'm also looking at time. Um, we're, we're nearing the end. We have 15 minutes late, 15 minutes left rather. So stick with me. Um, but I also wanna give an invitation to our fellow white um, brothers and sisters in the room um, to just know that your your voice matters and your voice i know i know that a lot of people probably shout at me for saying this and will say no but it's it's only your time to listen yes 110 percent, it is your time to listen in society in general but that does not mean that you are we are diminishing your story your experience because also part of the next phase where we're at as south africans is to be like what is the role of the white voice and how are we being inclusive of that as well? Because we, we don't want to have a situation where people just disengage now and, and, and just feel like ah, that's, that's not the point. And I know my view is not a very popular view, but it's, it's a healthy view, in my opinion. Um, as humans in a society, we like to be either or, and that's never healthy. We need, we, 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 yeah, from, from my view and my point of view, and excuse me for saying this, but from my religious point of view, I always feel like South Africa is almost the blueprint of what heaven is going to look like. And that's why we are like a case study of how do we get this right? All of these different kinds of people, all of these different experiences and pains and traumas and whatever. 
So for me, it's also important in my work to, to fight for your voice in the room as the white individual. And I just want to encourage you to not give up and to not give up on us as all humans. Um, yeah, because you, you still matter as well. Um, but the, the black voice right now is also still grieving and, and letting, letting its story out, um, which we invite you to listen to. Um, cool, let's play daughter and then we're going to move to rap soon. Dear my dear daughter, black girl, you are beautiful. Your curls coiled just enough to hold and house the rich fragrances of oils and fruit which exude from you. But those and equal ends above your head are soft enough for a crown of jewels to lay perfectly. For your kingdom lies in the heart of darkness, a bizarre hypnotic land of tender truths, laid and heavy with forests filled with opulent fruit. This frightening beauty is knitted in the essence of you. The weary climb through your forests and over your hills just to touch your hem and heel. Your body moves and curves like a rushing river with a black magical sensual appeal. Your springs of healing golden dusted waters calls the pilgrims. They all crave a brown sugary sweetness, a honeycomb toffee kind of cocoa, a blackberry coffee bean, a black eyed pea. My dear, don't you see these things? They were all inspired by you. You are the birthplace of color. You are not the other. You are the only, the only slice of majesty that looks, tastes, and resonates the way you do. So let your skin be loud as you enter every room. You are not to be lesser. You are not to be returned to sender. You are not a mistake. You are not too dark. You are perfectly brewed, you are an acquired taste. I love you, black girl. Don't ever apologize for the blanket of black pearls that form your skin. I know, your melanin carries stereotypes and stories, responsibilities, horrors, and memories which weren't even crafted by your hand, yet here you stand. A crucible of all things black. But that is not your end. That is your etymology, your history, the deep, dark, rich forest which you are rooted in, alongside your mother and your sister, soaking through your roots all the splendor that God gives you. So be nourished. Drink of nature's milk, for the bones of your heart need to be strong in this world to weather the storms of ignorant vocal cords and words. I love you, black girl. I love who you are, where you come from, and I'm beyond excited about where you are going. Now white woman, with a skin covered in a delicate coat of milk, I challenge you, pick up your pen and fill your page with immortal words of adoration for your daughter. Praise her beauty, highlight the intricacies that others might see as flaws. Tell her where she comes from, tell her you loved the hint of pink she carried when she was born. Scribe her narrative, but white woman, don't forget to read what I have written. Don't forget to tell your child about mine, so that when these two princesses meet, their smiles will collide, their fingers will intertwine, and they will marvel at each other and fall in love with all the various shades of color. I refuse for my child to be colorblind, and you should refuse your child to ever look down on mine. Let them learn their differences, but love each other all the same. Picture my little girl whispering into the ear of yours. I want to learn your story and know why it shaped your face that way. Don't you want to know the fairy tale that gave birth to my name? I know you say your tongue don't twist that way, but learn my name and I will scribe this too. Ladies and gentlemen, it's true. The blood of fear has left a nasty smear on the so-called idea of rainbow. So I propose a new goal, simply, Art. We are all simply art, flamboyantly diverse in our various shades, but without the differences, earth would be a bitter, bland shame. So love you. Love your skin and the ink that you were scribbled in. And love me. Love my skin and the ink that I was scribbled in. And I will forever and always smile. Smile because I was made just. Yay. 
me to share my screen again. So that was daughter. Um, daughter for me, it does feel a little bit of teach, um, but I think it's also quite a bit of build because I was aiming to express at the end anyway, a future where the, the, the young black girl knows exactly who she is and she, she lives in the fullness of that and the, 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 the glorious nature inspired beauty of that. And that the white young girl too also gets a letter from her own mother describing her own beauty. And that these two young girls live in this really nice ideal world. <laughs> where they're actually just admiring each other's beauty. They're not trying to make one like the other. They're just living side by side and enjoying that, enjoying the fruit of each other. Um, so yeah. Um, so I want to give you, um, you can write whatever you want in a way. I think they were Pamela and, but I want to give you almost maybe a suggestion in terms of what to focus on. So always remember the five things. What is the point to process, to express, to teach, to build or to break. But there's a thing called um, perceptual flexibility. It's a, it's, a co it's a term in life coaching where think of a very specific situation that it involved race, whether it was an argument, a discussion, whether it was an incident, whatever it was. And it's better if it, you were involved in that situation yourself because what you do then you can write from first position so writing from the perspective of me as I want to experience it in that situation what did I feel experience what do I want to take out of that scenario etc or you can stretch yourself and challenge yourself to write from second position which is their story which is what do I think the other person thought felt and experienced in that moment in that situation where, do, where are they now? What, what else are they experiencing? Then we write from the third position, which is from both sides, from both stories, both narratives. But you then embody the voice of a third person. So you take a step back and you're like, as a third person having watched that situation between A and B, what do I think happened? What is the view that I have of that? And then there's actually two more steps that you can take further, which I, I don't have on the screen, but it's when you take an even further step back in the fourth position, where you look at it from a systems perspective. So that is, um, how does it fit into the economy? And from the view of the economy, the view of society, the view of, of the country politics, how does that situation, that same situation that happened between A and B, what role does it play on a bigger system level or how does the system view it and the last and fifth position that you have with that is from a universe level so some people call it a god level some people call it a universe level or just a bird's eye view level taking the whole world everything into consideration what is the view of that the point of going through those steps is for us to build empathy, number one, to not just see our story, but to also see their story and to see our story in, 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 you know, as a collective, but also to get insight and to get perspective. Because sometimes when we look at it from a bigger view, we then get to be like, oh, maybe that's actually not true, or maybe that actually is truth and filter the emotions and filter the things. So that's my suggestion in terms of the, the spaces that you're going to write from. In terms of the writing process, I know some of you had asked like, but I want to be a better poet. I want to be able to write better and want, you know, the hard skills. I invite you to take a picture of this. I literally copy pasted this because um, I um, am adding to a textbook um, for kids and they want to learn like, how do they write poetry? Um, and they still do this. So even though I gave it to like grade nines, like this still applies to me today at my 26 years of age. So please take a picture of this on your screen. Um, like first thing I usually do is dump all my ideas on a page or on notes app or something. Um, again, there's no pressure. So don't feel overwhelmed. It's good that it's messy and makes no sense. Anything goes. Research is important when writing. Um, and my research, look at your old journals, look at magazines, listen to people, um, engage with others, Google. Google, the number of times I Google words, like what is the synonym of openness or whatever, Google. Um, and then I start writing the actual poem and I write, rewrite, love doing it on bright pieces of paper. I don't think I have, oh, here we go. 
So this is my thing that I usually use to, to write on. I think I've owned like at least three of these at different times. Um, <laughs> sometimes it's lists, sometimes it's mind maps, sometimes it's all of these different things. Um, and write, rewrite, all of those things. And then once you've written the piece that you are happy with, edit it. So you know that saying, write drunk, edit sober, do that if you want to. <laughs> um, and be ruthless with your editing as well. Like. Don't, don't hold on to words or lines because you like it. If it doesn't fit, it doesn't fit, let it go. Um, it needs to serve the purpose of the poem. And like I, I gave, um, um, I think it was Jolene whom I had given feedback to, you do need to get to a point where you, where you just let it be. If there's more that wants to pour out of you, write a new poem um, once you've honored the concept and done the poem. Um, but if you have any questions, I think we've run out of time. But basically, Basically, this is now your turn. You get to write, and again, Pamela and Michelle will, will give you more information on the, 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 the competition, but it has been a big, big, big pleasure to spend time with you. I'm excited um, to give into this world. It really is your, your turn. Write the change that you want to see in the world. Um, we're, we're doing something here. This is important. This is really important. And I appreciate all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Puno. I want to read a question for you in the chat box from Evie. Uh, it says, hi, Puno. I would like to know how the white youth can approach the race issue and get involved without getting angry or offended about race-related issues. That's an amazing question, Evie. Thank you so much. It's a brilliant question. I think um, I do do really think that the 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 young white person is in really in a listening position. And I know I said like, oh, we're not trying to just put you there and not involve your story. But when I say listen, there are different levels of listening. So number one, you're listening to get the information to just like hear it. Number two, you're listening to understand. So you need to be able to logically be able to understand and comprehend information. As if, for instance, like if you were you were listening to a lecturer and you understand the content that they're teaching you. Number three, you're then listening from a certain shoes and hear what they're saying. So in a sense of um, feel what they're feeling, experience what they're experiencing. So um, get into the lives of your fellow um, brown brothers and sisters, all shades of brown from again, Indian, Asian, colored, black, whatever. Visit them in their homes. De engage with them in a way that you would your white brothers and sisters, like on that level. Build genuine, authentic friendships. Though that's, that's the space where iron will sharpen iron, where you will really get a real and true experience. The, the, honestly, I feel like this nation will be built around dinner tables. Have dinner with them in their house. Invite them to your house. But more often than not, brown, black and brown people, we get invited into white spaces and not the other way around. So go into those spaces with humility. Don't go in the space trying to be the person, just go in with humility and listen from an empathetic level to understand and to be in their experience. And the last level of listening that we have is listen with the, the openness and the intention for your own views to be shifted. And that's a very vulnerable space and authentic relationships with black and brown people so that that trust and rapport is established so that if they are saying things that you are going to allow to shift your values and your views and things, you know you can trust what they're saying. Obviously, I'm not saying just take everything and you don't exist anymore. You have to have discernment and stuff. Um, but I really believe that's the role of the, the young white person where we're at right now. Um, uh, Puno, we do have uh, people that are asking, well, they have another question. I see Miss Tooth Mice has just uh, raised her hand as well. Um, so I'm very keen that like, uh, I think Samaya also wanted to ask a question. So I'm very aware of the fact that like, I would like to respect people's time and not go over the time. Um, but at the same time, it seems as if people are really keen to engage with you. Um, so I don't know if perhaps uh, you want to go a little bit over time or what you would like to do is maybe I could share your email address and then those that still have questions um, would be able to email you their questions. I, I put it in your hands. 
Um, I let's take one more question and then you're welcome to share my email um, if that's cool with everybody. <laughs> okay, awesome. Um, Pamela, I think then uh, you can take over here because I think Sumeya um, was first up wanting to uh, put her hand up. So I think she can be the last question. All right, thank you so much, Michelle. Sumeya, you, the floor is yours. Hey, thank you so much. Um, I'm actually partner partnering with one of my friends that's all the way in Cape Town. So we're going to join our poems together because we've we both went through something. Um, she just wants to ask a question. She sent me a voice note. Um, can I play it for you? Yeah, go for it. Okay, thank you. So basically what I... Okay, just tell me if you can hear it. Yeah, about... Okay, wait, wait, wait. So basically what I understand the poem has to be. Okay, wait, <laughs> sorry, sorry, I keep putting my hand on this. So basically what I understand the poem has to be about um like race and econo and like the inter its interaction with economics and your personal experience, right? So like how you feel racial matters or whatever impact you have impacted you or like um have impacted people that you know and how it affects the economy in a way and that's a question i think that's definitely something you can write about um you can literally take it anyway um so it's one of those annoyingly open book kind of things of like you know, it can be your personal experience, it can be your personal experience with in how it relates to the economy, how is the economy affecting your personal experience or the economy affecting other people's experience. So everything that she said is, is absolutely right. And if anybody wants to extrapolate it in a different way, they are welcome, as long as it's within the bounds of race, um, with sprinkles of the economy in there, or you're speaking about the economy with sprinkles of race. You, you can really decide so there's there's that's my answer but again i think pamela and michelle are also available to clarify in terms of those themes but I, i'm comfortable with it being um as open as that um yeah we are we are thank you puno we are indeed indeed available for that um i think um what michelle will do along with puno's email addresses she'll put up hers and myself for any more clarity you guys need um, but yeah, if that was the last question, I do have an announcement to make with regards to the competition you heard of if you were with us from the beginning. Um, so please don't leave as yet because it's really exciting and we'd like for everyone who was present to engage or tell someone who you know about this competition. Um, can, I, can I go ahead, Michelle? Yeah, that's, that's perfect, Pamela, go for it. All right, um, ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the end of this beautiful session. Thank you so much for taking the time out um, of your schedule to be a part of this. Um, before we adjourn, um, I have an announcement to make. Like I said, this workshop is an introductory event for Racial Awareness Week or RAW for short. Um, RAW will be taking place from the 3rd of May to the 7th. Um, and we would like, really appreciate that everyone who was present today be a part of Race Week. Um, or better yet, share the word and um, tell a friend about it, tell a poet about it, or a friend, it's, it's, it's completely fine. As many students as we can get to partake in this and learn and be a part of these conversations, the better for us as a society, as um, a university even. Um, during this week, many conversations and debates will take place, to name a few. Lobola, very interesting. Black text, very interesting. <laughs> Land reform and how history has shaped our racially divided economy. The list really is endless. Um, join us as we unfold the state we are in as a country racially, the effect race has. Okay, welcome to the wonders of online race awareness week. <laughs> um, 
Okay, everyone. Uh, I suppose then, um, really, what I uh, just wanted to emphasize then um, that Pamela was just going to close off with is that there's um, lots more race awareness week events. This one is just early, but it's got the competition. Um, so all of that will be made available on the NWU website. Um, lots of different events, nine of them to be exact, from the 37th of May. Um, and we'll make the uh, link available on the NWU website. We'll also be able to send out an email to all of you guys that are SVP for the submission link for you guys to submit your poems. So the submissions are open from the 9th to the 21st of April. I know you guys as students don't love reading, uh, but all of the details and the rules around that and the different categories, they are going to be up on the submission link. Uh, but I think what Pamela is just going to say is that there's three categories, one for best um, video submission, one for best text submission, so via text, um, so it doesn't have to be data intensive for you guys. Um, and then there will be a People's Choice Award. So the voting um, for that is going to be open from the uh, 28th of April until the 5th of May. We'll also make a link available for you guys to all be able to vote for the People's Choice winner. And so there's three categories, three vouchers of 1,000 Rand as a take a lot voucher each. Um, so Puno, I cannot say enough thank yous to you. Um, I think I speak on behalf of everyone when I say that this has been mind blowing um, and that I stand in absolute awe of what you have done in this hour and a half. Thank you so, so, so much. And thank you to everyone for joining us. Uh, we'll see you at more Race Awareness Week events.